But what's amazing to me is so like, I have to do some work to figure out what point they think you made. Because I, look, wait oh, yeah. a second, wait a second, wait a second. Wait, wait, no, no, no. no. hold on. No, no. Zing. Welcome back to another Debate Teacher Reacts video. My name is Nate, and let's go ahead and jump right in. Look, y'all voted this week, and you told me that what you want to see in this video is technically not a debate. <laughs> I looked at it for like a split second, and I was like, this isn't a debate. This is a gentleman's conversation of disagreement or something, which is actually a really good thing, and maybe I'll say more on that later. Well, today we're looking at doctors Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. Uh, this took place back in 2018 in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, I've been there many times. I, I love that city. Well, they sat down and discussed their differences on the issues of religion and its effects, all right? Now, because this is not a technical debate and there's no formal cross-examination to speak of, as far as I can tell, um, I may or may not declare a winner at the very end, okay? I think it really depends on the interlocutors and whether or not they really push their opponents hard enough, all right? So we'll see what happens here. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a lot of points of agreement. So I also believe that there is a catastrophe of, of arbitrary moral injunction and that there's a catastrophe of moral relativism and that 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 has to be dealt with and that there are genuine differences between the proper way of behaving morally and, and, and the improper way of behaving morally. And I think that they are grounded in hu human universals even though there's a, there's a wide amount of variation. So that, that's a lot of points of agreement, right? So we, we know that there's two things we want to avoid, we, conceptually speaking, which is the mor moral relativism and, and this kind of moral absolutism that's grounded in, 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 in an arbitrary statement of facts that you identify with religious fundamentalism. I would identify that with funda fundamentalism more generally, not, not with religious fundamentalism yeah. per se, because I see it also happening, happening in secular states, let's say, like Nazi sure. Germany or, or, sure. or, or, or... So it doesn't seem to be religious fundamentalism per se that's crucial to your argument. No, it's not. It was, so just to close the loop on that. Okay, that's interesting. Now, Dr. Peterson is setting up Dr. Harris here, and Dr. Harris, note this, Dr. Harris just agreed with the point that Dr. Peterson is making. It's, it's not just a feature of religions where we see this kind of fundamentalism going on. Okay, now let's see where this goes. The only reason why I would focus on religion in particular there is that religion is the only language game wherein fundamentalism and, and dogmatism it, where dogmatism is not a pejorative concept. Dogma is a good word, in, in, specifically within Catholicism. And the notion that you must believe things on faith, that is in the absence of compelling evidence that would otherwise cause a rational person to believe it, that in a religious context is considered a feature, not a bug. Elsewhere we recognize it to be a bug, and that's, that's why the, the unique okay, so, focus on so, religion. Okay, so, 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 it, all right. so is it reasonable to assume that the associate... We've already established, at least in principle, that there's an association between the totalitarian regimes, let's say. And, this, dog, and dogmatism, yeah. And the dogmatism that characterizes religious belief. Yeah. What do you think, although at least in principle, the, the secularist totalitarian states and the religious fundamentalist totalitarian states do differ in one important regard, which is that the religious types ground their axioms in God and the secular totalitarian types don't. And so there's got to be something about totalitarianism per se that's independent of, that's associated with religious belief in the manner that you just described, but that's not particularly associated with the belief in God. There's something that makes them, that's a commonality between them. And so okay. do you have well, any sense of what that might be? Well, I, I would, I, I think uh, one has to acknowledge that there's something uniquely pernicious at least potentially about religious beliefs because they, they have the, the otherworldly variable, the supernatural variable, the uh, you're going to get everything you want after you die so this life doesn't matter issue. That, right. that, that allows for a kind of misbehavior that is especially... Okay, okay. So, so... Well, see. so that's not really answering the question. Okay, so Dr. Peterson identified a commonality of fundamentalism between some religious folks 
and totalitarians. Uh, I take it he means like Hitler and Stalin and Mao, you know, and it appears that Dr. Harris agrees that this commonality is not religious in and of itself. So if a problem with some religious folks is that they share a dangerous characteristic with other non-religious folks, well, then that characteristic can't itself be religious since non-religious folks have it too. That's what Dr. Peterson is saying, and Dr. Harris agreed, okay? And so the question is, what is that characteristic then? It's a great question, but Dr. Harris has not provided an answer yet. But let's see if he does. Themes that, so that the claim would be that if you, if you put forward axiomatically your claim that God exists, then you can use that claim to justify whatever arbitrary atrocities your system might throw off. <laughs> look, at the, uh, look at the genius fingers. Do you see the, the genius finger? Look, look, Dr. Peterson and Dr. Harris are both extremely intelligent, okay? In their fields, they are rock stars. And so the, the genius fingers, you ever notice this when somebody's truly smart and they're like trying to communicate their genius brain in a normal mouth and it just like the fingers come out because they need help with the genius fingers. I love it. Yeah, I, I guess okay. the p only point I was making there is that not all dogmas are created equal. I mean, some dogmas are on their face more dangerous and more divisive. You know, right, you, but, if, but what I'm curious about specifically is because it seems to me that the dogmas of the USSR and the dogmas of Nazi Germany were as pernicious as any religious Dog, dogmas, and, and they may also share important features with yeah. pernicious religious oh, dogmas, yeah. but it isn't yeah. clear to me from your perspective what those commonalities would be. Well, so, I mean, in some ways you're recapitulating an argument I've made, and this is an argument that I would make against you were you to claim, as you've ha you have elsewhere, that, that atheism is responsible for the greatest atrocities of the 20th century. The idea that Stalinism and Nazism and fascism were expressions of atheism simply doesn't make any sense. I mean, in the case of fascism and, and Nazism, it doesn't make any sense because the, the fascists and the Nazis, by and large, were not even atheists. I mean, Hitler wasn't an atheist, and he was talking about executing a divine plan, and he got lots of support from the churches, and the Vatican did nothing to stop him, and fascism, as you know... Aye, aye, aye. You know, I mean, you could make the argument that Hitler was not a typical atheist, but to imply that he was religious is just naive. I mean, any student of history can see that Hitler was not religious. If you read up on his life and the things that he said, I mean, especially his private conversations with his inner circle alone, you'll see that he hated religions. And he particularly thought Christianity was an invention of sick minds and, you know, completely absurd I mean, he was, at the end of the day, an influential politician, and that's where a lot of folks get confused, because a 10-minute search on Google doesn't give you that full picture of Hitler. Maybe Dr. Harris will get into this, but these arguments about totalitarians actually being religious trades on an assumption that religious ideals cause folks to become totalitarian. And so if totalitarians act like totalitarians, well, it's because they got it from those religious folks, right? But that in itself is a claim. And if that's all you got in this conversation, it'll only be assumed without justification. Somebody needs to challenge Dr. Harris on this. Well, let's see what happens. No, uh, coexisted quite happily with uh, Catholicism in Croatia and Portugal and Spain and Italy. So, but even in the case of Stalin, what was so wrong with that situation was were all of the ways in which it so resembled a religion. You had a personality cult, you had dogmatism, uh, that uh, held sway to a point where apostasy and blasphemy were killing offenses. You know, the, the people who, who, who didn't toe the line were eradicated. And, you know, so, and nor so to, to take a, a more modern example, North Korea is a religious cult. It just doesn't happen to be a, a one that is focused on the next life or... or you know, supernatural claims of, so what of would magic. Be, right. okay. So there it is, okay? All the totalitarian regimes of the world, even though many have said they hate religion, many have said they think it's the opiate of the masses, right? They're, they're actually religious. Why? Well, because they act religious, okay? But now we have two alternative observations here. Dr. Harris, on the one hand, implies that totalitarianism comes from religions. And Dr. Peterson says, well, there is a human characteristic that both religious and non-religious folks share that caused them to be totalitarian. 
But this characteristic is not in itself religious. Now, this is where the clash lies. Hopefully this gets hashed out. Okay, so what would be the defining characteristics of a religious totalitarian movement that would make it different from a non-religious totalitarian movement? Well, I mean, it's just, because they, there's aspects they, that are they, similar. They, yeah, they may, yeah, they're very similar. I mean, the, the problem is dogmatism. The overarching problem is believing things strongly on bad evidence. And, be, be, and the reason why dogmatism is so dangerous is that it is it doesn't allow us to revise our bad ideas in real time through conversation. It is, it, dogmas have to be enforced by force or the threat of force. Because the moment someone has a better idea, you have to shut it down in order to preserve your dogmas. Okay, okay. So, so the commonality seems to be something like claims of absolute truth at some level that can't be, that you're no longer yeah. allowed to discuss. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. so, okay, so that's another point of agreement then, I would say, because part of the reason that I've been, let's say, a free speech advocate, although I don't think that's the right way of thinking about it, is because I think of free discourse, like the discourse that we're engaged in, as the mechanism that corrects totalitarian excess or dogmatic excess. Mm -hmm. And so I also think that systems of governance that are laying themselves out properly have to evaluate have to elevate the process by which dogmatic errors are corrected over the dogmas themselves, which is why I think the Americans are right, say, with regard to their First Amendment, is the process mm. of free speech is the process by which dogmatic errors are rectified, and so it has to be put at the pinnacle of the hierarchy of values, yeah, something yeah. like I, that. No, I think you and I totally agree about the primacy of free speech. Okay, okay, yeah. good. Okay, so that's another. Fine. Yeah. It's good. Okay, so, so then wait, could, I think there's, it, there's one point that we should just uh, mm -hmm. lock in our gains here. It sounds like what you're saying is that the reason to fear religious dogma is really on the dogma side and not the religion side, which at least leaves open the possibility that something could exist over on the religion side that doesn't have that characteristic, right? That often they travel in tandem, but that the thing to fear is not the religious belief, it is the dogmatic nature of the way it is conveyed. Oh, yeah. well, is that fair? The, the, the other way to say that is the only thing that's wrong with religion is the dogmatism. If you, if you get rid of the dog, I've got no problem with the buildings and the music and the, and the paintings and... You know. Wait, wait, no, that, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not a trivial, that's not a trivial point. And it's All right, so it sounds like for Dr. Harris, the problem with religion is dogmatism, okay? But here's the question. What does he mean by dogmatism? What is he talking about? Are, are, are we all just going to talk around this term? I've heard this term several times now in this conversation, but nobody has asked for a definition. What does Dr. Harris mean by it? You know, how do we know that when I'm talking about dogmatism, uh, you mean the same thing, right? If what we mean by dogmatism is expressing certain beliefs arrogantly and, and not allowing challenge or discussion about these beliefs, then you'll find a lot of religious folks saying, well, that's not what we do. Religions contain certain dogmas, but holding to and expressing certain religious dogmas is not dogmatism. Okay, that's like, that's like saying science is scientism. They're not the same thing. But more than that, holding to and expressing certain religious dogmas is not totalitarian. So what Dr. Harris still needs to show is the road from holding to and expressing certain dogmas to totalitarianism, and he hasn't done that yet. It looks like he's just assuming that it always happens. Now, here's the thing. I can give you one clear example right now of expressing certain dogmas without totalitarianism. Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a believer. Just look at the history. Jesus claimed to be God, and he allowed those who disagreed with him to kill him for it. And he taught his followers to have the same attitude as him, which means if his followers are following him wrong, that leads to totalitarianism, right? See, this is what needs to be fleshed out in discussion. I've been really interested in the commission of atrocity in the service of belief. And it's tempting to pin that, say, on, on dogma and then to associate that with religious dogma. I think that's all tempting. But the fact that chimps do it shows that it can't be a consequence of something like religious belief, unless you're willing to say that the reason that chimps commit atrocity in the service of their troop and their territory is because chimps are religious. And so they're not religious and they don't really hold a secular totalitarian viewpoint, but they act out, they still act out the, the atrocity element that's characteristic of human behavior. And so to me, that makes the problem deeper than one of mere, let's say, surface statements, surface statements about yeah, yeah. metaphysics. Well, the, the, obviously the 
So here's Dr. Peterson fleshing out his argument, right? Okay, so the totalitarian bent that we see as a feature of societies is based not on ideology, but on our creatureliness, you know? It's a base nature that expresses itself that we must overcome, in other words. And because of that, it expresses itself in both religious and non-religious contexts. So there's his argument. And he's provided evidence for this with his observations about chimps. Okay, so let's see how Dr. Harris responds. The problem of primate aggression, which we've inherited along with the chimps, is deeper or at least different than the problem of religious violence or, or totalitarian uh, okay. po- political structures that, that okay, get good. the worst out of people. So, uh, I mean, we have, we have these primate capacities that we have to correct for, and we're busily trying to correct for almost everything that we've been evolved to do. I mean, we're not, we, you know, we, we don't like the state of nature for good reason, and virtually everything that's good about human life is born of our... I would argue culture-based and, and you know, highly intelligent and necessary effort to, to mitigate what is in fact natural for us. And natu- I mean, tri- there's nothing more natural than tribal violence, which of the sort that you're, okay. you're well, describing well, in chimps. Okay, okay. So, right. so then- so, But wait a second, okay? So this is where formal cross-examination would really help, okay? Dr. Harris, do you now agree with Dr. Peterson's alternative explanation? Right, because you're speaking as if you do. You, you just said that our creaturely tendencies are deeper than religion. So for the record, do you agree or disagree with Dr. Peterson's position? Because if you agree, then you have to recant your own position. I mean, that's how this works. I mean, and, and what most worries me about religion, I would say, I mean, obviously religion can channel these primate urges in unhappy ways. So you, you can get tribal yeah. violence that gets amplified by religious dogmatism, and that should trouble everyone. But it's not unique to religion. It's also nationalism and it's racism and it's all other kinds of dogmatism. But what most worries me are those cases where clearly good people who are not necessarily captured by tribalism per se uh, are doing the unthinkable based purely on religious doctrines that they believe wholeheartedly without good evidence. So... You have the person who joins ISIS, who, who wasn't even Muslim before they converted, you know, 16 months ago, and they go all the way down the rabbit hole to the, the most doctrinaire, most committed, most uncompromising view of just how you have to live in this world if you're going to be Muslim. Uh, and they join ISIS based on the idea that salvation only goes one way and that dying in defense of the one true faith is the, the best thing that can happen to you. There's no question that there are individuals who have made that journey. In fact, there are individuals by the thousands who have made that journey. And there are far more benign versions of that. There are people who just waste their lives, I would argue, converting to whatever the belief system is and just wasting a lot of time worrying about hell or worrying about the fact that their child is gay and the, the, you know, the creator of the universe doesn't approve of that. Let's... Uh, and so there are all, all kinds of suffering that strike me as truly unnecessary, born not of, again, ape-like urges, but ideas that any rational person would, if believed, would, fo- would follow to the, that same terminus. I mean, the, the thing is, if you, buy, if you buy the fact, again, to take Islam as, as a current example, if you buy the claim that the Quran is the perfect word of the creator of the universe, never to be superseded by anything humanity does now or a thousand years from now, that commits a rational person. Then then the exercise of human reason is bounded Mm -hmm. by this, I would argue, pathological frame, which leads to certain outcomes that should really worry us. So, So, uh, yeah, this was a verbose exercise in not answering the primary challenge. Okay, and what helps Dr. Harris is ethos here, uh, because ethos, pathos, and logos matters in uh, discussions, debates, all that stuff, right? What helps his ethos here is his calm demeanor and his erudite use of language. 
Okay, but the bottom line is he is not disagreeing with Dr. Peterson at all. It's as if Dr. Peterson is saying, well, you know, maybe the explanation for all home appliances working is that electricity is running throughout the home, right? And then Sam Harris says, well, I see that and I don't dispute that. But what bothers me is this one particular outlet in the corner over here, you know, where the electricity is coming out of. That's the real explanation. That's not an explanation. That, that's not an answer to the primary issue of electricity running into all the appliances. And this guy just spent three minutes going on and on about not answering the primary challenge. So you tell two stories. You tell a story about someone who has an absolutely terrible life. They're in a, in a, in a jungle where nature is trying to kill them all the time. And while they're trying to be killed by nature, while nature is trying to kill them all the time, horrible barbaric thugs are making their life miserable in every possible way. Okay, so that's one poll, let's say, and then another poll you identify, and these are hypotheticals, so I guess they're fictions, that's one way of thinking about it, even though they're extracted from real situations. They're, they're, they're meta-fictions, they're meta-truths, that's another way of thinking about it. You contrast a good life, and you know, that's a life where pe the person has enough to eat and enough shelter, and you know, they have the things that you would expect people to want. You say, this is a bad life, and you say, this is a good life, and so, and then you say, that's and, and then you make a side move, which I would say is that that's an objectively verifiable fact. I would say, I don't think it is an objectively verifiable fact. I think it's a fundamental moral claim. And I think that's where you put your stake in the ground. Right. And I would say, when I read that, I thought, well, if you take your jungle story, hmm. which you've extracted from a bunch of horrors and, and compiled, and you take your positive story, which you've extracted from a bunch of horrors or a bunch of... of, of, of quasi-utopias, let's say, and compiled, you're two-thirds of the way to a landscape of hell and heaven. Right. Well, so then why not continue the abstraction and say, look, what we're really trying to avoid here is hell. Oh, yeah. What we're really trying yeah. to move towards is heaven. Yeah, but oh, yeah. But well, no, as I soon as I mean, you do that, you're my in name, a religious landscape. No. no. <laughs> That's a very complex and verbose way of making the claim that Dr. Harris is essentially... You know, what he's doing with his book, The Moral Landscape, is he's guilty of doing the same thing that a religious person does. Okay, he's trying to describe morality without God or religion, but he's sometimes utilizing the same format as the Bible to do so. And so he's sometimes using the same terms. He's, he's telling stories and he's talking about good and evil. So really, he's doing the same thing as a Christian. I mean, that's a very weird thing to say, and, and maybe Dr. Peterson is setting up Dr. Harris for something later, but it seems to me that this is easily dealt with. Uh, you know, in terms of a response. I mean, just because two teachers use illustrations and share terminology when they teach doesn't mean they're teaching the same content. I mean, you could say that Dr. Peterson is using terminology that I would use, uh, but not with the same definitions that I'm using. And all Dr. Harris has to do is point out that he's, well, he's simply using a methodology and language to communicate because it's effective. Because that's what's expected in today's culture, not because somebody else who said something antithetical to him also used the same methodology and language. I, I feel like if Dr. Peterson had a point to make, he stopped short of making it. It's, it's very interesting because, like, the, this, the, I mean, the, you and I were talking, we were talking about this at dinner. <laughs> We were talking about this at dinner and how the, the, the overlap or lack of overlap between our audiences. And so, like, I just heard from your audience there. And you might have heard what, from the odd convert. But, but what's amazing to me is so, like, I have to do some work to figure out what point they think you made. Because. I, look, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait, wait. No, no. 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 Hold on. No, no. Zing. And then, I said, if you're going to produce a fiction, well, why not go well, right to the end? Because okay, so you did produce a fiction. It's, you, you can tell stories by way of communicating certain ideas. I mean, that's obviously... So, I mean, I'm not saying stories aren't right. incredibly powerful and useful and inevitable, right? It's like we... we you, Wait, I think you are. You're, no, you, I'm, might I'm, not saying, you might not be saying that, they're, that they're, they're, not, they're not inevitable, but you are debating their utility and power. 
because oh, you no, told, no. you said no, that you don't no. need okay. the story as an intermediary. Uh, no, let's, so the, now we have a few doors open here. Well, which I, think I don't know. Again, what the I, I think the point is just falling flat. You know, Doctor Harris isn't using illustrations that trade on familiar categories to a religious person. He's using illustrations and shared terminology to communicate an anti-religious message. Which, by the way, agree or disagree with Doctor Harris, but he is a good writer. I don't know if you like if you go back and read his books, like he's a great communicator and he's doing what I think he has a podcast too or something, but he's doing what I would do if I wanted to be effective today. He's drawing from culturally shared references and language and using it to make his own unique point. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I don't know. Plus two, here's the other thing. Like I'm not familiar with Dr. Peterson enough, but it sounds like he views the Bible as merely stories, okay? So, in this sense, he breaks from traditional Christians who understand the Bible to be more than a mere narrative, that the Bible is actually an historical record of God interacting with humanity, and it's just a series of stories that are communicating something. This whole branch of conversation is just a weird use of time. I would not have gone down this route, this route at all. I'd be seeking to poke holes in the greater arguments that Dr. Harris makes by asking the right leading questions, you know, which means centering on those greater contentions and then fleshing that out and trying to find true clash and cross-exam. That's what I would be doing. This is what happens in the moral landscape, I think. Tell me, tell me why I'm wrong, because I'm really trying to understand it. Hmm. See, I think you dealt with G.E. Moore's problem of infinite regress by, by staking a moral proposition. And your moral proposition was, look, here's a way things can be horrible, and here's a way things can be good. Can we accept that this is horrible and this is good and that we should move towards good? And if the answer is, yes, we can accept that, then we can proceed, and maybe we can even proceed with extracting values from facts, but we have to accept that a priori presupposition yeah, first. Yeah, and yeah. you insist that we have to accept it because it's objectively true. And I don't think that's correct. Well, so, so Dr. Peterson is pointing out that in order for Dr. Harris to make his arguments in his book, The Moral Landscape, which is essentially a materialist explanation for objective morality, and that explanation is grounded in the well-being of humanity, Ultimately, in order to do this, Dr. Harris has to begin with an assumption that well-being is morally good. And Dr. Peterson is right. Even if you redefine morality to mean something more like functional flourishing, you know, or, or survivability, whatever promotes physical well-being and discourages harm. If you do that and you take seriously the notion that God does not exist, which means the universe is cold and indifferent to life, which is what Richard Dawkins says, then you still have to begin with a smuggled in morality that physical well-being is morally good. And so therefore, whatever harms that is bad or else you have no moral obligation. There is no responsibility for humanity to obey. If you don't smuggle in that moral good and that moral ought, then you are left with the true diagnosis of human existence with no God, that we are here and there is no ultimate rhyme or reason to it, whether we live or die. These are all just facts of history and the universe is indifferent to it all. And that's not me saying that. I'm paraphrasing the famous atheists of our time. And Dr. Peterson is right to push back on this. It's a smuggled in morality. If we agree, that there is some way in which religious texts carry some kind of value because they allow people to figure out how to navigate their lives in ways that might reduce suffering, reduce the complexity of the choices that they have to make. Presumably, you will agree that that would be consistent with an evolutionary interpretation, that the fact that the stories themselves uh, are um, yes. functional would provide an advantage to those who were deploying them. Yes. So here's the problem. Isn't it then also true that those stories are responsive to past environments? And so the claim that these things might be timeless would be suspect. And yes. in fact, you would expect a spectrum of uh, durability. Some stories would be right in a brief moment. And yes. Okay. All that's true. All that's true. So far, so good. Well, so far, well, so good. This is, this is actually, I think, quite excellent then, because <laughs> what we have is a recognition that there is something to these belief systems that has to do with practical realities in the past, and we also have an acknowledgement that we cannot trust in these things based on simple faith, because even if they are, can be certain to have worked at some point in the past, we don't know what their relevance is to the present. Right. No. <laughs> okay, so this question is interesting because it takes a small but important leap. 
All right. And this leap is a mistake. If stories that happen in time are situational and therefore they are not timeless, that doesn't mean that what follows from that is that there are no timeless truths embedded in the temporal historical stories. So, for example, if I told you a story about, you know, the time I was late to school, well, I went to school in the 80s and early 90s. All right. So my story about how school worked and the particular clothes I was wearing at the time and the specific car that took me to school and all that, um, it's not going to hold up 50 years from now. But the fact that being late has consequences is a timeless idea that will hold up 50 years from now. Time waits for no man. That, that was the old saying back in the day. Right. And that's true now just as much as it was 2000 years ago. And it'll still be true in the future. So to point out that the historical situations change over time, it doesn't undercut the timelessness of the divine revelation that is expressed within them. That's, that's two things about that. Um, that's exactly why we're having this discussion. And you see what happens in the most profound of such texts is the idea that the process by which your knowledge is updated has to occupy a position in the hierarchy of values that supersedes your reliance on dogma is the fundamental claim. That's why, for example, in Christianity, the notion is, is that the word is the highest of values. And that's the embodied word. And that's the thing that mediates between order and chaos. And everything else has to be subject to that. And I would say that's not a claim that's unique to Christianity. So, for example, okay, you no, see I think, I think, we, I think we... just another thought about what Dr. Weinstein said just a moment ago. You know, just just because these timeless revelational truths existed and worked in the past, that means we have no way of knowing how they work today. I mean, that's false. That's what Christians call hermeneutics. You know, the idea that there are revelational truths that are universal across time and they are expressed situationally in history in order to glean how these truths apply to the 21st century or whatever time period we're in is exactly what pastors, theologians, and Christians do all the time every day. It's called hermeneutics. You say you believe in God. You have been... No, I say I act as if he exists. You say what? I say I act as if he exists, okay, so, which is a much more precise claim. Okay, so, so then what, what... But in this case, what... That you, so you act as though God exists, yep. and in addition, I've heard you say that I act as though God exists, that I'm, I can't really well, be so an atheist. Well, so far, it seems yeah, that. Right, yeah. We'll the, see. The, the night is young. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so in that sense, I'm not really an atheist. I've, I've heard you say this. So that, it, it, well, to, some of you is. Well... In, if I were really an atheist, I would be far more poorly behaved than, in fact, I am. Right? I would be like Raskolnikov committing murders and, and assuming there was nothing wrong with more, it. It would be more likely, yes. Yeah, okay. So, so Wait, that's a big distinction. Uh, I need, would yeah, I need to know. Be more likely. What was that? It's a big distinction. Well, Raskolnikov was, I mean, as, as probably up there as wicked as you get that you would is very different than it would be more likely. Taking the safety off the gun is not the same thing as shooting it, right? Yeah. Is the it? temptations laid open to Raskolnikov would be more at hand. Okay. Just as they were to him. So, what, in, that, so in, in what sense do you mean, what, what is the God that you act as though he, she, it exists? And what is, the, what, what is the God-shaped thing I must have in my life to prevent me from being a, quote, real atheist? Well, okay. Wow. What a missed opportunity. When you say, what is this God you're referring to? And what is this God-shaped hole that you think I have? That is a question without nearly as much teeth as, you know, can you unpack your argument that I'm not really an atheist? That I would be more like Raskolnikov if I were a true atheist. By the way, Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment is a brutal killer, a murderer, and a thief. So, God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time. As the most real aspects of existence manifest themselves across the longest of time frames, but are not necessarily apprehensible as objects in the here and now. So what that means in some sense is that you have conceptions of reality built into your biological and metaphysical structure that are a consequence of processes of evolution that, that occurred over unbelievably 
vast expanses of time. And so that's, that's something that operates across tremendous expanses of time. And it plays a role in the selection for survival itself, which makes it a fundamental reality. Jordan, if so, I can I just cut in here with one question. Uh, stop with that for now. What? So this is an observation maybe for another video, okay? But again, I'm not very familiar with Jordan Peterson. It's very interesting to hear him speak about God. He speaks about God very much so using foundational archetypes and categories. That's not what Christians do. Uh, Christians speak about God more anthropomorphically, you know? I mean, Christians recognize the grounding of God as the foundation for transcending categories, so to speak, but God goes beyond these things and is expressed personally as well. Dr. Peterson doesn't talk about God in that way at least not in this conversation. Uh, so I don't know what you can do with that observation, what you will. Uh, maybe somebody in the comments can help me better understand why that is the case. But anyway. So I, I was not hearing in that list of attributes a God who could care if anyone masturbated. Uh, I was not hearing a God who... Depends on what else is stopping you from doing, Sam. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I missed that. Wait, I, wait, I wait, said wait. it depends on what else it's stopping you from doing. Well, yeah, okay, so it's, it's yeah, important to live. But seriously. It's, it's important to do something other than masturbate. Yes. Uh, yes, which, is, which, which actually yeah. constitutes a problem yeah, which is, for many which, people. Which is harder than it sounds. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not hearing a, 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 a God, a personal God, there it who is. can possibly right. hear anyone's prayers much less answer them right so and so also, and and good for dr harris he's noticing what i just noticed and so perhaps dr peterson has set himself up for some defeaters if he somehow invalidates the personal aspect of the god of the bible okay but i mean let's see how this plays out so i'm just i'm wondering what percentage of religious people who who would say oh yeah i believe in god and it's the most important thing in my life uh what percentage of those religious people do you think have in mind a God of the sort you just described? I don't know, Sam. It's a good question because when I go talk to people, when I, when I talk to people online and use exactly this terminology, millions of people listen. So it's not so yeah. obvious well, which, what percentage of no, people see it this way. It's, it may be that they have the intuitions, but they haven't been articulated well. I mean, this is, this is the problem. Uh, this is what worries me about this. So, you, I mean, you... you you could do the same thing with the idea of, a, of ghosts, right? So, so people traditionally have believed in ghosts. It's, a, it's an archetype, you might say, the ghost. Survival of death is certainly an archetype. So they, and, and we know what most people most of the time mean when they say they believe in ghosts. And I say, I don't believe in ghosts. And you say, no, no, you, you do believe in ghosts. Ghosts are your relationship to the unseen. That's a ghost. So you have a, a, a new definition of ghost mm -hmm. that you're putting in, in the place provided, which I have to say, well, of course I have a relationship to the unseen, so uh, yeah, I guess I do believe in ghosts. You know, you, you win that argument. Uh, but that simply isn't what most people mean by a ghost. Most yeah, people mean... Yeah, but you can't use that simplified argument about my conception but, but, of ghosts as an analogy for the propositions this, this, that I just put forward. This is what I see you do. I mean, maybe you have more to say on the topic of God, but this is what I hear you doing with God. You have defined the God that most people believe in, and we know this is the God that most people believe in. I was in. asked what God I believed in, not Yes, what no, most but I'm, a, I'm asking you what percentage... <laughs> yes, but... You, you, by shifting the, the definition, you have robbed the, the noun, the traditional noun of its mm. traditional meaning, and you're giving, you're imparting to people hey, a wait sense. A wait a second, wait, wait, wait. a second, people. I, I'm not so what sure What do you mean this? by traditional meaning? Look, it's one of, the, one of the elemental claims in the Old Testament is that you're not even supposed to utter the name of God because by defining it too tightly, you lose its essence. And so let's not be talking about what the classical definition of God is here, okay? It's a historical non-starter. Okay, the, and there's plenty of religions on. that can make I, it... Can I check in with the audience? There is an element here where they're both right. I mean, obviously what Dr. Harris is trying to do is he's trying to pinpoint a more, what everybody would understand to mean God, even though this line of questioning was 
probably not the way he should have gone at all in the first place. In that sense, Dr. Peterson is not really helping matters with his own specific definition of God. But what Dr. Harris doesn't understand is that this is kind of like the spaghetti monster problem, right? Like, it's a category error to assume, you know, that God is some kind of floating teapot in the universe. And so therefore, if there's no evidence of this floating teapot in the universe, we can safely say that there is no God. The problem with that is that God is the ground of reality. He's the ground of being. And so when you make the transcendental uh, uh, argument, like the cosmological argument, that is a valid argument to make because there must be some explanation that is the ground of existence in the first place. That's what the cosmological argument seeks to identify. And so, in that sense, Dr. Peterson is correct it's to sort of zoom out and show that God is greater than, you know, just simply talking about his anthropomorphic facets. Let me say, Sam, um, I do not believe in a supernatural God, but the God that I heard Jordan just describe, I do not have any difficulty understanding why he might care if you masturbate, and I also don't have any trouble figuring out how he might answer yeah. prayers. Well, well, tell me more then. Well, I, I can tell you, I can tell you, I can tell you how a prayer might be answered. Okay, but the, here's the problem with this conversation, because now it's, it's just way off the rails. You know what I mean? Like, Dr. Harris wants to pinpoint some flaws and errors in Dr. Peterson's view. I mean, even though this is a gentleman's conversation, that's ultimately what's going on here. And so the first problem with all this is... He's not asking direct questions to get Dr. Peterson to justify his claims. He's going the long way around and wasting a lot of time, frankly. The other problem is Dr. Peterson is also taking the long way around in his response. And from my vantage point, it's probably partly because maybe he doesn't want to be intellectually pinned by Dr. Harris. This is why you should ask way more direct questions in cross-examination. You know, you, you made this claim, now justify it. You made that claim, do you have any evidence for it? How do you hold to your argument over here when this evidence over here appears to undercut that? That's more like what, you know, cross-examination and debate should be. But on top of everything else, I don't think Dr. Harris has thought about this. If God exists then he is the archetypes and categories that Dr. Peterson says he is. Well, maybe not all of them. So it's not that Dr. Peterson is changing the subject. He's, he's just answering a different question that Dr. Harris is not asking. And that's why you need to be way more direct about your questions, especially when it comes to these kinds of conversations, okay? You need to make your opponent clearly identify their claims and reasons to support them in order to then attack these components for everyone to see. Wow, this is hard. I, I would say that there, there is no clear winner here because at the end of the day, I don't think the goal was to win in this conversation. Even though there are disagreements and some of those disagreements were very vociferous, the goal was to fully communicate two different viewpoints while seeking to come to agreement. Okay? That, that was stated at the beginning of this conversation. That's not the goal of a debate. The goal of a debate is clash, okay? The goal of a debate is to best your interlocutor and defeat their contentions, all right? That's why I would argue that you need to go back and watch this conversation again and again and again, okay? Because this is what your conversation should look like. Your conversations on the street should not look like formal debates, all right? You need to go back and take notice, particularly of how Dr. Peterson frames the discussion right like in the first few minutes he's trying to affirm dr harris as much as he possibly can he tries to identify points of agreement to even restate dr harris's own contentions in such a careful manner that dr harris agrees and he does agree and then he asks questions about areas of disagreement why to come to an agreement all right, this is first state evangelism. I mean, if you haven't taken a look at my signature method of communicating the Christian faith, it comes directly from the Bible. Uh, it comes directly from uh, the rules of formal debate. It comes from the uh, proper order of persuasion. You have to check out that series. It trades on exactly what Dr. Peterson did in this video. Well, thanks very much for watching and subscribing. As always, if you have a particular apologetics debate that you want me to uh, take a look at and react to, definitely let me know. I'm collecting all of your suggestions and we're going vote by vote every other week um, on those. Please also, if you have not subscribed, please subscribe and share these particular videos. The more that happens, the more Wise Disciple will get out to everyone else. Well, I'll take a break and return soon with more videos, but in the meantime, I'll say bye for now.